he can't make it. He said he got his vaccine earlier and he's under the weather. So mm. I wish I was in that situation, but not. Yes. Either, so. yeah. Good for him. <laughs> All right, so we do have a quorum. Hey, hi, Todd. So I think we can get started. Uh, anybody willing to take uh, minutes? Todd, if you can, we, I haven't heard from Wayne, but I think we have enough for quorum to start. Uh, but anyway, uh, thank you for joining. And uh, I think we can start before. I just want to welcome everyone and uh, uh, before, uh, we have some new. We have a new member of the appropriation committee, so I'd like to uh, welcome Bill Bill Flannery, and uh, to appropriation. This is the first official meeting, and I do see Wayne just coming on. He can't hear me; his audio is not connected. But <laughs> and we'll just wait a minute. So everyone else is the same, same folks. Hey, Wayne. You're on mute, but uh, if you can hear me. Anyway, uh, just to get started, I have just have to uh, make an, an introduction to our remote our remote meeting. So, uh, this open meeting of the Hopkinton Appropriation Committee is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March twelfth, twenty twenty, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID nineteen virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID nineteen virus. We are complying with the executive order that suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. All members of public bodies are allowed to and encouraged to participate remotely. The executive order, which you can find posted with this agenda of materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely as long as the public body makes provisions through adequate alternative means to ensure interested members of the public are provided reasonable access to the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. For this meeting, the Appropriation Committee is convening by video conference via Zoom webinar as posted on the town's web meeting calendar and the board agenda, board's agenda ident identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded, and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that the others may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Meeting business ground rules. We are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do, sir, do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will invite board members to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called further. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in dialogue with other members, please do, do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Not every agenda item will feature public comment. For the public forum portion of the agenda, the chair will work with the meeting host to call on each pre-registered speaker to make their comment. Each speaker will have up to three minutes for their comments. Finally, each vote taken at this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. All right, any questions? All right, I think we can begin. On the agenda tonight, uh, the Appropriation Committee will discuss the fiscal year 22, 2022 budget proposals for the fire, police, communications, and DPW, including water, sewer, and facilities and engineering departments. We'll also have review of questions from previous budget sessions and review of changes to the estimated revenue or expenses. And we finally review of planning for Appropriation Committee report. So um, I don't think there's any uh, anyone, any public, uh, wants to give any, uh, has anything to present or want to talk? I don't think there's anybody here, I guess. Uh, ben? Uh, that's correct, no, think... no, one else, no one else from the public. Okay, so we can get to the next item on the agenda, which is uh, budget proposals for the fire, police, communications, and DPW. Um, 
Tim, I think, do we want to start with uh, the, the fire this evening? You're on, you're on mute here, Tim. Uh, anywhere you want to start, but I do not see the fire chief here. Uh, I just I just messaged Chief. He said he's going to be here in just a couple of minutes. Okay. okay. So let's start with uh, police. Uh, uh, Chief Bennett, welcome. I think this is your first year uh, doing this. So. It, yes, thank you. And, uh, it's nice to be here. Uh, I have no idea what the process is, and I don't know how formal of a presentation you're looking for. Uh, I did. We, I was at the select board meeting and presented a structured presentation on my the vision and mission and goals for this coming year, and I can run through that again if, if you'd like. Okay. Yeah. So we don't officially uh, go to the uh, select board meeting, uh, so it'd be good to go over that. Uh, this is the first. This is our first meeting for the year, so uh, uh, excuse us if we're just. Uh, getting getting uh, warmed up here. So uh, do you have any materials or anything uh, that we can um, talk about? I, I prepared oh. a, a presentation and, and, and it has my budget has been submitted and um, and basically I talk about what we're gonna do this year in that present in that in that verbal presentation. Okay, do we have any access to the presentation to, so you can um, take control is there, or? Is there a, um, an email I can share it all with you? Or I can share it with Ben. It well, no I think pictures. it's I no think pictures. He... My intention was to just read it. So the the if I can just chime in, Mr. Chairman, the police budget is shown on page three of enclosure four of the January 26 budget memo. That gives the dollars for the operating, and then the capital is the three cruisers, which is shown on either the enclosure eight of that document or on the five-year capital plan and shown in both places so all right what page of the, i'm sorry what page of the budget memo so uh there are eight enclosures to the budget memo and the police are shown on enclosure four page three and it just shows their personnel service and and expenses and the auxiliary police expenses. Okay. Uh, let's see, so Chief. Uh, I could speak very okay. highly. Chief well, Bennett, if you want to talk. Yeah, structure. talk at a high level, that would be great. Okay, so the police department budget is 94% of, of, the, of the budget is personnel. Uh, the increases uh, that are shown uh, represent uh, a few key factors um, that have to do with uh, contractual pay raises, uh, along with the, according to the collective bargaining agreement, as well as being a newer department, we have 16 people moving through the, the, the various steps in the collective bargaining agreement, and those steps are typically around 5%. So, um, that being said, 16 out of 28 offices moving, getting uh, contractual pay increases as well as step increases, it brings us to about a 4% increase uh, in the annual budget. I am requesting an additional officer during our strategic planning process. We identified that where we sit about seven short of where we should be um, based on national standards and uh, surveys of similar communities. And that was done by a vendor who came in to help us develop our strategic plan. And we have been increasing slowly over time to get towards that, um, that more favorable staffing level. Uh, the position that I'm requesting accounts for a little less than 2% of the overall increase, which brings me to a 6% increase. So that's one, one position? It's one position. And that position uh, may be offset from um, community host agreement with legacy farms that uh, maybe, I don't wanna put anybody else on the spot, but it's my understanding that that position is gonna be offset. The, the first year, that's correct. The first year is gonna be funded by the host community agreement. I believe that's the plan. Chief, do you have any unfilled positions at this point? I do, I, I have, um, so I have, I have two unfilled 
patrol uniform position. And I've gone to the board and had those approved. And we're gonna start the hiring process quickly to get some academy trained people hopefully on board. And then there's an open deputy position. And along with that, through the backfilling process would, would create another position on the street. Okay, she, um, and 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 uh, Mr. Chair, I, you know, I'm sorry. Tell me, tell me if you want to do this in a different way. And I don't mean to break the meeting up. If you want to continue through the whole presentation and then have questions or just ask questions along well, the way. That was going to be my next piece. Uh, are we also going over uh, uh, capital articles too? Yes. Okay. So uh, I can speak again at the high level there. You know, the things we need are buildings, people, and cars. That's our, our primary need. We have a replacement cycle that typically accounts for three cars per year. During fiscal year 2020, uh, the decision made, was made, you know, uh, as a team that we were going to limit our capital requests. And I did not, and I did not push forward with any requests last year. So that, therefore we did not get any cars. So as the year progresses, the hours get up, get more hours get added to the cars, the miles keep piling up. And even if we get three cars, we're still always gonna be three cars behind. That being said, we're in the middle of a, a pandemic with financial uncertainty. I didn't feel it was right to come asking for six cars. So Mr. Chairman, the data sheets that the police department filled out are on page 30 and 31 of the capital package that has been provided to you. If anyone wants to look at the detailed sheets, uh, the chief did a great job filling those out. The other thing I would add is that although it's under facilities, there's funding for a new roof for the police station in the capital budget. Okay, where's the, is the roof on this? Uh, Oh, that's under facilities. Right okay. I see it. There you are. Okay. For the three uh, rep units, uh, is all electronics? Is it new electronics or is it ported? I know um, I'm not... so, yes. So within the within the, the car replacement program, items within the vehicles have a life cycle, and certain items are replaced on that life cycle. So a car might be up for a new data modem, or it might be up for um, a new computer, but unfortunately with the new, new model type, all of the cages and everything else is going to need to be replaced. So it drives the cost up every time there's a new model style. Do you, uh, Crown Vic. No, I got the old white Crown Vic. <laughs> You're going to see it at the Horribles parade this year. Never changed <laughs> 30 years out of that equipment. I know. I know. Chief, may I ask, what do you do with the cars that you're retiring? Well, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna give uh, Ben a, a big props. We used to trade them in to the vendor that we purchased the cars, and they also install all the equipment, and we got very little money on the return. And uh, and uh, I'll give Ben credit; he created a, a situation where we now auction them out to the public, and the the yield and return on them is four or five times what. You wouldn't believe what we get for them, for the cars. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Chief, do you anticipate a catch-up year um, if we delay these, or are we having a good enough, I guess, how is the experience with keeping the cars, I guess, extending the cycle of them? And not that we want to keep you in old cars, but is that something you could consider going forward is extending the life of all cars from, three, from a three-year replacement cycle? Again, the intent is not to you know, nope. keep you in anything that's unsafe or unusable, but just kind of looking for it sort of fiscally, is that something we would consider or something we still need to look at over another cycle or two? Sure. So if you look, yep, yeah, absolutely. So if you look across the fleet, um, you have different type of service vehicles. So for instance, the exe my executive car will get passed down to a detective and okay. it'll be driven for... We, we just took, a, I think, a 2010 uh, type of car off the road. Uh, we have the, one of the detective's cars is a, probably, I, I don't have the chart open, I'm sorry, but I want to say it's like a 2010, the silver uh, sedan, and we run a long life. 
but the frontline cars, they're practically worthless after, after that time period. Very, the only frontline car that we can repur ever repurpose is the sergeants. Okay. There's just nothing left of them. You know, and I just, I just want to add, I'm not sure exactly what happened the last two years, um, but I know my last at least two years on the board, um, that request for three cars each year always got whittled down to no more than two, sometimes one car. So for the chief to say that right now there are three cars behind is probably being a little bit gracious to the town. And, uh, you know, I, I would say that we're probably more than three behind. Thank you, Chief. Through the chair, I would agree with you, Mr. Safari. Mr. Chairman, I'll just toss in that if we get, if we stay on the three car cycle after one round, we'll be caught up. Won't be one year, but you know, once you get a new car, it's you're caught up. Once all the cars have been replaced on the three years, that's true. Three -year yeah. cycle, so, so this is a self curing problem, but it's a slow cure. And if the town has excess resources, certainly considering accelerating it would be something that could be on the table. But we're not creating a 50 year problem here with this. Right. Okay, uh, any additional questions? I had, I had a question back to um, uh, just the manpower. I know Chief, you were mentioning that uh, the study that was put out, um, you know, shows that we're about seven heads under, um, you know, what recommendation was and national standards. Um, you said that we've been working toward catching up to that. And I'm just wondering, uh, do we have anything in that report? Did it show anything with the, the population trend of the town and the uh, head count on the police force? Are, are we actually catching up or is that population trend accelerating and you know we're just not falling behind as quickly or what's the status there? Yeah, through the chair, um, that, that is an excellent point because the, the strategic plan was a snapshot in time. Uh, the, the vendor uh, did go and to speak with people at the town hall and look at projections but that number is based on our current population. So um, if we were, we may need, we may need to reevaluate it uh, as we move forward, but just looking at the window within the, um, the short term of the strategic plan, it put us at that number. Thanks. Okay, any other questions? Good questions. All right. Um, just, just uh, you know, for uh, for the CFO, I guess I know that this is mentioning uh, these cruisers are going to be hybrids, and it's talking about the fuel savings uh, that we'll be getting. Is that um, is that recognized anywhere else in the budget? The expected fuel savings, or is it we kind of go through a year and really see and and try to actualize that before we have it affect anything? Mr. Chairman, yeah, the, the fuel budget, of course, is a function of how many vehicles we have, how much they get driven, and what the prices are. So you might get more vehicles, and the price goes down, the mileage goes up. Uh, you know, it's a, there's a three-component equation there, and we have not yet adjusted down the budget for fuel. If we see over time a pattern emerge, we can look at doing that. Gotcha. Thank you. Not yet. Okay, thank you, Chief Bennett. Thank you, Everett, through the chair. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. All right, next I see uh, we have the fire department representation. Hey, Chief Slamman, welcome. Thank you, apologize for being late. I came from another meeting here. I was trying my best. <laughs> no problem, we have a pretty long agenda. So as long as you showed up somewhere, hopefully in the next, <laughs> I don't wanna say how long this will go, so. But anyway, uh, uh, I think uh, we can kind of give the same type of uh, uh, overview that we got from Chief Bennett, where I see we already have the fire. So we can just start, start talking about your operational budget. 
Great. If I could um, just take a moment and uh, open with um, every now and then I can report a result that I'm really proud of. And uh, I just want to, and, and you guys are very involved in this, is the fact that um, a couple of years ago we were here talking about doing a safer grant and getting four firefighters. And that was before the uh, pandemic had struck in us. And I just want to report to you just how impactful they have been during the pandemic. And the, um, the way I can really say is uh, in my data, I track an effective response force and I've reported that to you before. And um, in the year 2020, our calls, we did uh, 2,204. Um, and in my report, you'll see from the prior year, out of those calls, we had about 304 calls that we didn't have enough personnel by our measures. Last year, we dropped that from 304 down to 103. And um, I've had a, with that number had been tracking up on us for my first four years as fire chief. This is the first year where it tracked down. I think that's a great result. I think I can say that we had effective staffing in that time period. It helped us a lot during the pandemic. It took some, you know, to get four firefighters on the grant in one year was a great move by everybody. And, and, and I just want to report the effectiveness and I hope you appreciate that like I do. <laughs> so against that backdrop, my uh, budget goals are to deliver a quality service to a changing community in a safe and effective manner at a reasonable cost, improve the delivery of the effective response force that I just referenced, which means an improvement in the number of emergency responses we successfully respond to with a minimum number of personnel required to address the mission, and focus on service delivery, employee development, community engagement, and emergency management, community preparedness, and risk reduction. I highlighted that in my, in my uh, budget presentation. I hope you're able to see that because this year I am not requesting an increase in personnel. I want to maintain the same level of personnel that we have. I want to focus on community risk reduction. Uh, I think there's a couple of reasons, but in the last two years, I can pleasantly report to you that our request for service actually trended down after four steep years of going up. Um, so that really helped us kind of catch up. And I like to think some of our community risk reduction efforts are panning out um, and our preparedness efforts in town are panning out. And finally, just preparing for the community's additional growth and diversity, the impact of the opiates, mar marijuana, and mental health and wellness within the community. So directly to the numbers on the budget request. The full-time salary line is an increase of 5.4% from last year. The number is basically a three-year contract that was settled last year and the all three years applied into this year. It was two years backwards and this is the final year of the contract when they settled it. That, that increase was um, a total of 6. Two five percent There were some savings based on a couple of retirements and the new employee replacements were at a lower rate. So the, end, the net number ended up being at 5.4% increase. And basically, I think I explained it to you, but our structure for that is one, um, one administrator, two chief officers, and 31 firefighters, and three call firefighters. That's the structure, and it would be the same this year as last year. Any questions on that part of the budget, or do you want me to just keep moving? So, so I have a question. You were talking about you had the uh, grant for four firefighters. Is that, are we, is that part of this budget? Was that last year? Now for the next year, that's on the bud our budget? So there's three years to the grant. Um, I think I'll be close on the numbers. I'll say to you, the first two years, there's uh, a reimbursement of 70% of the cost. Um, ben is the expert here. So he's sitting in the background and he'll jump in. The third year of the grant is 30%. I believe that's next year. So, and then you have the full cost of the, of the firefighters. Well, Mr. Chairman, the, the expenses for the firefighter shows up in this line and then it's offset by that revenue on that kind of declining schedule 
that the chief mentioned in our sources of funds side. So, so you're seeing all the costs there. There are no costs held back to, to factor in for this being a grant funded. Okay, I mean, my, my where I'm coming from is the 5.4% increase. Was that totally just contractual? Because there's no in request for increase in multiple personnel. Multiple years. That was that was catching up on multiple years of negotiated agreements. It was not that was that wasn't a one year pay raise. They it took longer to settle the contract, and that was catch up money for several years. Exactly. It was a two, two, and two and a quarter contract. So. Next year, it, if it's just contractual, it will not be 5.4% because that this is a one-time uh, higher, higher cost or higher increase. Yes, they're currently bargaining for next fiscal year. Okay. Any questions from Bill, uh, Wayne, or Todd? Yeah, I, yeah, th through the chair, I have a question. Um, Earlier, Chief Bennett shared a study that showed the police department was short seven folks. You're not asking for any more, but have you had a similar study done? And, and what do those numbers look like compared to the 31 you have now? So I'm reporting to you, I use a matrix on an effective response force. It's a little different. Um, um, you have... Todd Sestari on your group, he was working me for a lot of years on just using things like population and uh, uh, national standards. He wanted a little more meat on the bone for why we hire personnel. So I dove in and I literally analyzed each request for service, what the national standard would look for for a response, and I measure each call, whether we've been able to deliver that. I just feel like it's a much tighter than trying to use. We do do charts and overlays of uh, population um, and request for service. So I, I just reported to you that we had two years of, after four years of increase straight, we had two years that we've just declined. And whether that has to do with um, pandemic or change in, uh, I'm not sure, but it was coming off a really hard incline. Um, based on all of that, I feel comfortable that this is not a year that we need to increase our staffing. To give you an idea, if we went back to just the population overlay, you in the 30 year tracking that we did, and I could bring up a chart, it's, it's basically you would need to add a firefighter, one firefighter every year, similar to police data that would, that would give you the same matrix. Um, we would be on schedule to add a firefighter this year after the four grant firefighters came in, the way they had done what I've shown you in past data. But with the drop in requests for service um, and the successful number, I think I'm, at, I'm good this year with the amount of staffing. I did try to request some money so that I could do an administrative change in status to help with some of the running of this community risk reduction project. So that's, that's one of the internal operational pieces I'm trying to do, but not change staffing, use the existing staffing to to do that. Thank you. I mean, Chief, Chief, not to belabor this, but um, it's great that we've seen the, the decrease in calls. Do we, are we confident that that's, I don't know, I, I guess not, not having, um, and maybe we can't analyze why something didn't happen, but I guess how confident or comfortable is a better word, are we that that trend will continue? I just want to see you getting a, you know, us getting a bind. And... I, um, you can't understand how much I appreciate the way you just framed that. So okay. um, as a fire chief, this is a couple of things. So picture the tool we use for the first time in the, come, in the town bought into the concept of this safer grant. There's one, there's one this year that we could have applied for that you, it would literally cover all of the costs of a firefighter. Um, I think it has to do with the timing in the in the faith of where the data is taking us. And there is some risk to put a firefighter online takes me about 18 months from the time that somebody says, go ahead and get a firefighter to have them in the position they can do it all. And I always worry about that lag. Um, but against COVID, against the challenges that we have, I, I hope that if there was an uptick, 
an option for us next year would be able to look at another grant. And I hope that it's similar in value to like the last one we did. There's, there is some balance operationally to me to come to you either in groups of say two or a group of four, like we did two years ago, operationally, cause it's a, you know, 24, seven, 365. That's what makes this whole model work well in operations. So I hope I'm answering your question. There is always a little risk, um, but um, I would ask you for a firefighter if I really felt like I had to have one right this second. I, I think this year we're good. It might be a different narrative next year and I hope everybody looks at it in the same way that you just did. <laughs> okay, thank you, Chief. Mr. Chairman? Chief, yes. you, brought up, you brought up some great points there. I, I would just like if you could just share a little more with the group since they're having this discussion on two dimensions of this. First, you said the number of responses where we didn't have the effective force drop from about 300 to about 100. Yes. What does that 100 represent as a portion of your total responses? Was there about 2,000 responses? Yeah, last year it's based against 2,200. Our high was the year before was 2,500. And, and I really, um, some of the past data said we were gonna be approaching 2,800 right now. So I'm trying to let the data kind of guide me a little bit. Uh, and, and I share that with you because the whole thing could change. We, they could put in two more senior housings next year and we might be looking at a 3000 number, but that's not panning out right now. And to overstaff right this second is a, is a danger to us. And I, and I have some facility stuff coming up in the next few years where we literally don't have a lot of room for additional staff. So. I'm trying to look at all that on the board here and bring it to you in the right order. So j just for the group, we're, we're at about 90%, 95% of the responses are an effective response, right, right now. And what, what we found in the Coast Guard was, it was pretty cheap to get from 60% to 80% for effective responses. And it was reasonable to get up to 90, but when you start climbing above 95, Yep. You really have to spend a lot to get above, to be certain you can respond above 95% of the time. It's like an asymptotic curve. It just goes, it, it's very expensive. And I guess the other point I would like to share, so first, great job on the 95% that were effective responses. Thank and you. second, uh, these effective responses are really effective responses. Can you talk about what an ambulance run effective response looks like? Because I think a lot of people would think it's just two, two people in a, in a vehicle. Yeah, so you'll hear my ambulance request later on. You know, it's, a, it's an expensive piece of equipment with, and we send two paramedics out in it. Um, the national standard is to have four personnel to manage a patient, and then it has to do with moving them, appropriate care in a timely manner based on so you can do um, concurrent services on them and, and get them the corrective care in time. You know, the, and we've done really well on that. Our additional personnel, we have more people during the day now when our volume is twice as heavy at night. Not many fire departments don't do that. You know, I give my crew a lot of credit because, you know, there's, that could be a lot of frowning faces, but they, a lot of people, we have extra help during the day and that's when our highest call volume is. So that's why I think this organization is working so well right now, statistically. So that's great. We're sending out four, four highly trained people for an ambulance response and we're making it work 95% of the time. That's really a home run. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's, that is a lot better than we've done for 20 years. So um, I do worry a little bit that that data curb and will come in different next year. The pandemic actually lowered our medical request for service, which you wouldn't think would be the factor. So I'm giving you a great number. Realize it will probably change a little bit, but we're not anywhere near the 304 number. And our high was 356. And those are drivers where I'd be saying we need staffing. Perfect. So there, there are two capital requests and the details on those are on page 38 of that long document, but Ben will just bring up the sheet there to show the, uh, the two items, the ambulance, which we intend to fund partially, uh, substantially. It's a $360,000 ambulance. We hope to fund 300,000 out, out of the ambulance fund. And then the engine for refurbishment that was approved last year 
and was held up because of uh, we suspended our capital program. Yes. Um, can I start with engine four? Is that okay? So engine four sure. is a uh, it's a refurbish. I'm just going to find my sheet here. One second. Apologize. Where my dad is. Give me one second to find my capital sheet with the data on that. <clears throat> okay, so engine four is a 2011 pumper. I came to you last year and there's some pictures in there. It's got quite a bit of corrosion on the body and it started to get into the frame system some. We did a, a, an evaluation on it last year and we did a repeat evaluation this year. The, um, the inspection, they, they are worried about what's going on in the frame, but they feel very confident that we can do, if we do it now, we'll catch it and it will uh, give us approximately to six to eight more years is kind of what they're giving us um, with that work. Um, the reason I really choose to request a refurbish versus a brand new pump is a couple of reasons. I've got another pumper coming up soon. This one was scheduled to last um, an, another five or six years. It's a, and, and it's not getting its life out of it. I really like the pumper. It fits in station two and my other engines don't. And to, to have to design one, station two is critical to us right now with the pandemic to have that separation. Um, so all of this is really positive. The price to me makes sense because if we can get another six or eight years out of something with 110,000 versus me uh, saying, let's do a $670,000 pumper this year. Um, to me, that all makes sense economically. So I hope the report gives you enough detail. I gave you a lot of pictures and explanations, but I, I uh, normally wouldn't go this way, but this one I think makes sense to do it. And I think it's good for everybody. The details are on page 78 of that long capital document. Just, just curious, because um, of the need, the corrosion, do the engines get uh, washed at the DPW facility? Are they, can they? I was going through my head too, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, um, there's, there's, a, there's a few things. They get, they get sprayed down at the station. Um, there's a lot of debate about whether an underneath sprayer, what they're doing for the, so the new ladder truck we're getting, right? That is coming in with, uh, I don't even want to make pretend I say all the stuff because I really delegated a lot of that to the deputy. The frame is really specially treated to avoid uh, what all these fire departments are going through with uh, salt corrosion. So um, spraying them, we do really good here. Um, it's been a problem for a long time. Part of this is the, uh, the frame here, there's a lot of aluminum too. And I think we get a little bit of oxidizing issues and salt issues as a combination between what happens on the body and what you see under the frame. So I'm not an expert at it, unfortunately. Um, to put an underneath sprayer in and the number of runs we do, I'm not, I gotta kind of look at that, especially since we're looking at a new fire station, whether that's like a, a way we would wanna go. I don't know going down to the DPW or not, whether that would get us anywhere. Cause we still have to get back to the fire station and whatever gets on the frame or not is kind of my theory. So I'll leave that, it's a great question. <laughs> Well, John Westerling kept on for years saying, oh, when we get this DPW with the, uh, uh, the car, the wash, uh, that how much more life we're going to get out of the vehicles. So, uh. yep. Yep. I, I'd love, I want to be optimistic, but I just, <laughs> I'm afraid I'll give you a false hope. <laughs> okay. All right. Any other questions? So, and if I can just finish that. I, I can't envision there being another year on this one. So it's literally like 
it, it, it won't have a lot of life after this and I'll need to talk about a new pumper with you. So I, that's why I think this is such a, uh, a strong need right now. So I'm just trying to emphasize that it, it's gonna switch out of the category of refurb. Refurb, there's some risk to it, and I, um, but I, I have a lot of confidence on this uh, application. And the ambulance is on page 38 of that packet for anybody who wants to look at the detailed photos and info on that. Okay, if there's no further questions, thank you, Chief Slammon. Thank you, guys. Okay. All right, next we have communications and I believe it's Megan Durad. Do I, did I pronounce your last name correct? You did, thank you. <laughs> okay, welcome. I know I know you, you were here last year, um, but uh, I think that was the first year you uh, gave a review, if I recall. It was, so, yes. Okay, so again, welcome. And uh, why don't you start? I think we have a pattern going. Just talk about your <laughs> operational budget first. Sure. Um, so, of course, similar to both chiefs um, and the line of personnel services, there are contractual um, increases coming through every year. And um, like Chief Bennett had mentioned, I do have uh, dispatchers going through the steps of increases as well. So I, I do um, deal with both of those, you know, throughout the years. And, um, you know, any other wage adjustments or merit increases um, would be part of that as well. <clears throat> and then um, expenses, it looks kind of like a roller coaster on my line here. Um, and it, it has changed a lot over the years with communications because we, you know, we're just finally getting in, settled into what this department is and what it will, you know, grow into. Um, and it took us, you know, a couple stumbling blocks, I think, over the last five or so years to, to kind of get that ironed out pretty good. Um, but the biggest portion, I would say, of, of our expense line is taking on some expenses that originally were not part of our budget, such as some of the pre-employment items uh, that we do. We kind of do through HR, but we, we pay the cost of them. And then the biggest thing on the horizon for me coming up is going to be a real di deep dive into our radio infrastructure for all of public safety, police, fire, DPW. Um, I've, I've been in touch with a radio vendor who's going to come in and kind of give me a site survey so we can see where we're at, what our equipment's, you know, where our equipment's at, ages of certain equipment, what stuff may need to be replaced, what stuff probably still has some life left to it, start talking about preventative maintenance programs with them and maybe replacement programs and whatnot. Um, I was kind of shocked to learn that some of our equipment is over 30 years old, um, so it's, you know, just like anything else, it's, it's technology, it's, it's got a lifespan as well. So unfortunately, it's, it's a high priced item. Um, so going to be taking on that and seeing, you know, where we're at as far as making a plan for, for, um, you know, planned replacements and, and life cycles of items. Um, so that's mostly the um, expenses and then we do have some, thankfully have some potential offsets. The state 911 department offers two grants that we've success, successfully been able to apply for and receive for the last several years. Um, it's, it all comes from, if you look at any of your phone bills, whether your landline phone or your cell phone bill, there's that 911 fee that's attached to your bill. And all of that comes into the state 911 department and provides funding for um, local communication centers. And through our two different grants we get, we get a training grant that allows us to pay for classes and play, pay personnel costs to allow the dispatchers to maintain their certifications that are mandated by the state. Um, and it will um, offset some of those costs. And then there's also what they call a support and incentive grant that allows us to make some upgrades to our comm center or pay some salaries or purchase some supplies to, that would be going in our comm center. In the past, we've purchased chairs. This past year for fiscal 20, um, Ben and I worked together, it seems like forever, 
to replace the console workstations that the dispatchers sit at every day. The the ones that we had were 16 years old or so, however old the building was. And they were falling apart, starting to break. We'd replace items and they just break again. So I used the grant from fiscal 20 to replace those. And it covered a very large portion of, of the project, which was really helpful. So, and it's it's got enough flexibility with it that it can it can offset in a couple different places. So that's um, very helpful. One big struggle for us is overtime costs, um, mostly because we do have to backfill everybody 100%. Uh, we have a minimum staffing of two dispatchers on every shift. And if someone is out sick, takes a vacation day, whatever the case is, we have to backfill that position. So it makes it tough when things come up that you're not necessarily planning for. Um, I do have two National Guard members and one um, gets activated. So those come and sneak up on you and you just have to, to deal with them as they come along. So uh, we make do and, and get through, but that's primarily our big areas um, for our budget wise. If there's any questions. For the first question, um, I guess there's no change in personnel um, and you have a 5.1% increase. Same question as Chief Slam and is this con just strictly contractual? Is it backfilling, same negotiation? It's uh, strictly contractual um, as well as uh, there was a wage adjustment for the per diem staff um, and a merit increase. I don't, I think we're caught up, if you will, in the sense of catching up for contractual increases. I think this current budget year we're in now absorbed that what Chief Slammon was talking about. So this is, if I recall correctly, all just strictly um, step increases and regular contractual increases. Thank you. Any anyone else have questions? I I just share that uh, from the earlier hearings and discussions, the biggest factor in the expense side is the recognition that we need to start spending money on these communications towers that are used by police, fire, and DPW, but nobody has been spending any money on. So uh, the expense budget for this department is actually down somewhat and, and all the increase that you see there and more is going to the new tower program. So Tim, is the tower program, is that it's under expenses versus it's not large enough to be, is it annual costs or is there a big cap, is there a capital expense there too? Megan, it's an annual contract, right? Of about, is it 10 or 10,000? Yeah, so what we put into the expense line was more of a preventive maintenance, there is no actual annual contract in play at the moment, but that is on the horizon. But this is repairs and purchases of mobile radios, portable radios, um, repairs if something goes down at one of the tower sites or in dispatch. Um, currently, this fiscal year, I do not have any capital um, requests, but I do anticipate once we kind of dive into the system and figure out what's needed, I anticipate a um, a capital request to follow that, but I, I would have no clue of a number or when. So, so the money went into the miscellaneous contracted services and you'd use that to hire vendors. Yes. And just so everybody on the committee knows, the town manager extracted funding from the budgets of police, fire, and DPW, I think 3,300 from each to create this pool in communications. Okay. Any other questions? Todd? Nope. Wayne? Nope, I'm good. Bill? All set. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Megan. No good problem. job, Megan. You're an old pro now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go that far, Tim. Come on. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Okay. So uh, let's see. Next, I lost. Uh, we have uh, DPW. John Westerling, welcome. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Appropriations Committee. If I can, I'd be happy to give you a 30,000 foot look at our budgets and then happy to dive lower for any detailed questions that you might have. Sounds good. 
So the Hopkinton DPW submitted its FY22 budget proposal that was consistent with the criteria established by the select board and the town manager. Our proposed budget allows us to continue to provide the services and maintain the infrastructure that are essential to the welfare and quality of life for the town of Hopkinton. And I offer the following highlights of our FY22 budget. We are sustaining the critical public work services at FY21 levels in the highway, water, and sewer divisions. The highway budget increases by 2.5%. The water budget increases by 0.6%. And the sewer budget decreases by 6.5%. We are matching the FY21 level of investment in our pavement management plan by conducting $1.16 million of improvements in our roadway network when the general funds are combined with our chapter 90 funds. And that work will be complemented by the Main Street Corridor Project's full depth reclamation over the next two years. In response to public requests, we'll be making major progress on cleaning up the town's urban forest with a budget of $250,000 in the tree removal budget, which is up from 150,000 from last year. We are satisfying our solid waste and recycling contract increases through a 2.1% budget increase. We're improving the safety and efficiency of our cemetery and road excavations by adding a mini excavator to our fleet. We are replacing capital equipment that is unsafe or has reached its serviceable life by replacing a 28 year old chipper that is not equipped with modern safety features, an eight year old highway truck that has 110,000 miles on it, and a 13 year old sewer truck that has 100,000 miles on it. We are replacing critical infrastructure that is at risk by replacing the water main that serves Woody Island. We are protecting the quality of our water supply by cleaning the Alprilla Farms wells and installing a chlorine injection system at the Grove Street tanks. We are ensuring that our sewer system is watertight by searching for any inflow or infiltration. We are taking the next steps towards the development of the Pratt Farm Well with funds for the engineering of the next regulatory approval steps. And finally, we are supporting the Parks and Recreation Department with the management of their facilities through a budget of $105,000. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Sorry, if I, I could just point out that that was my error. The, the... The sheet I had, there are two versions of the budget, a 1% increase and a 2.5. The, the version I had when John first started talking was the 1% version. I now have the 2.5% 2, 2 version, which is being proposed. Oh, man, now I'm in shock here. Wait a minute. Okay. Can you uh, scroll, scroll up a little bit so I can... Oh, that's the other one. Public works, there's only one difference between the two budgets, and it's the two differences, the tree budget and the uh, the amount spent for, for Parks and Rec. Okay, what I saw that the admin budget was up 8% for personnel services. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that covers um, annual increases and also we have several long-term employees so that's longevity payments in there as well okay seems a little high but okay any other questions on the operational budget Okay, silence. Gift to the capital page, enclosure eight, page one of enclosure eight. And for your information, the public works items are detailed uh, with extensive documentation, photographs and background materials starting on page 98 of the capital project that was provided separately. So I can't see the for P19, the street sweeper and retaining wall, is that rec is that zero recommended? Okay, it's not recommended by the town manager. Our manager was recommending deferring those to future years because 
for budget constraints. Okay. Any other questions? Yep, Mr. Chair, I'm curious, and there may be some in here. Like we were hearing with DPW, there was some refurbishment in cases instead of re, re, uh, replenishing or replacing. Is there any opportunity for that with some of this machinery as well? Uh, through the chair, uh, for the chipper, I would say absolutely not. It's 28 years old and it doesn't have the modern safety features uh, the highway truck and the sewer truck, I would say no as well. Those have 110,000 miles on them. And, and if you look at the capital uh, request, it does have the amount of money that's been put into both of those. Uh, those are older vehicles, which didn't have the benefit of our wash bay, which uh, to the chairman's point earlier, uh, if you come down to the DPW 24 hours after a winter storm, you'll find that all of our trucks have been washed free of the salt on them. So the, the, the team is really doing a fabulous job of, of maintaining those. So those, those two older vehicles, they have considerable body rot. Uh, the engines are okay. As a matter of fact, one of them, the highway truck, we may repurpose that one instead of having it for an, uh, an everyday truck that would be a frontline truck. We might reserve that depending upon what the, 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 the trade-in value would be or the, the auction value. We might reserve that to... Uh, put that as a, a, a truck for our seasonal summer employees, as an example, a truck that simply wouldn't be used on a, on a daily basis. Um, so can I, get a, can I get a little clarification? Um, I'm sorry, uh, John, on the, you, you say, is P17 the replace the truck for, is that a highway department or is that the sewer department or it's both dual use or is there a second truck I'm not seeing? Um, yeah, the highway department. Yeah, that's the highway. If you look further down, the sewer enterprise fund has the S2. Ah, okay. I see it. And those are paid from uh, sewer revenues as opposed to the general fund for the for the sewer enterprise vehicle. Okay, just, just checking because I know in the past it was actually a shared truck and there was a discussion years ago about how that gets... I didn't know if we were going in that direction. Okay, I just didn't see this uh, section. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I think the shared vehicle that you might be thinking of is the Vactor truck. And that was the truck that was used by water and sewer and highway. Yes. Uh, so uh, through the chair again to, to the question that was asked by Mr. Flannery, we have done refurbishment in the past. Uh, the sweepers are very expensive and maybe six years ago, seven years ago, we put some $30,000 into that to extend its life and we've gotten a good seven years out of it. We've also done similar with uh, some of our one ton pickups in the past when they were possible to, to be refurbished. We, we took old vehicles and we put new dump bodies on them. And we were actually to, able to save those dump bodies and use those again. Uh, so at this point for these vehicles that we're looking at this year, that's not a possibility. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions? Or did we want to did we want to go over the sewer enterprise and water enterprise? I guess we didn't really did we go into those? John covered the operating aspect and the capitals there in front of in front of on the screen. For the uh, for the water. We are looking at an operating budget increase of 0.6%. And on the sewer, we're looking at an operational budget decrease of 6.5%. No, we took a huge hit on the sewer costs as a, as a homeowner. Is that... Uh, stabilized. Is it, is it stabilized? <laughs> New story. Yeah, that was a, uh, we took a 30% hit last year. We did, Mr. Chairman, and as, as uh, Mr. O'Leary stated, we have stabilized that enterprise fund and actually based on our uh, the revenues that we're seeing this year, that stabilization uh, will have a very good picture this year. No, there was a 
drought this summer and a lot of people had to water their lawns. <laughs> so I go, that must have been, uh, it's a, as long as you get the water back, it's probably good for the uh, sewer fund, I guess. Not that only for the that, homeowner. They wouldn't do that, that it's illegal. So, so many people working from home, uh, they were washing their hands at home, they were making coffee at home, they weren't using the benefit of their, their office water and sewer. So, so we did see some, some increases there as well. Interesting. Any other questions? All right, thank you, John. Thank you very much. All right, next we have uh, facilities engineering. So we have Dave Deltario. Welcome, Dave. Hello, good evening. How is everybody doing? Thank you for seeing, um, seeing us this evening. Um, facilities, uh, like I say again this year, we're just uh, maintaining the uh, same level of service. Um, we added, um, I say added. We we added one new property um, that we're that we're maintaining. Uh, that's a six Walcott Street. It's the um, it's a single family house uh, the town uh, purchased. Um, Park and Rex moved in um, to that site. Uh, we renovated the building uh, during the you know fiscal uh, this this fiscal year. Um, through the pandemic to kind of increase space, um, provide social distancing, um, additional space for staff. And, and the big part is we, um, we eliminated the lease um, of 85 Main Street uh, for the park and rec um, department. Um, so that was a, a good reduction in, in the budget from 21 to 22. Um, Working with the finance office with Ben uh, Sweeney, we're, we're strategically using um, COVID funds to pay for all of the additional COVID costs uh, in addition to providing a um, bit of an increase in, in level of service for, for some of the custodial and cleaning services or for town hall and library and some of the other buildings. Um, and we're gonna maintain those services through uh, this fiscal year. Um, half this fiscal year will be covered by the COVID relief funds, um, but the um, we're able to maintain the services through the end of the year without without asking for uh, an increase. Um, the other facility that we added increases for was the Woodville Fire Station. Um, in discussions with the fire chief, that that station is going to be maintained, uh, staffed full time. And I just increased some of the utility costs and, and you know septic treatment costs and to, to just maintain it wasn't a big a big increase. Um, overall, uh, the facilities increase is, is under one percent this year. Um, I think we're we're maintaining. Um, you know, we don't have an increase in our utility costs. We've signed up another um, solar um, net metering agreement. Uh, to continue to help, you know, maintain level level costs for our utilities. Um, so that's the really real quick, you know, facilities is, you know, really put a, a strong effort forward this year. I'm, I'm proud of my staff for, you know, coming in every day. <laughs> we're, we're the first responders to open the doors and keep the, keep the walks clean. Um, we responded to a couple outbreaks of COVID um, quickly so that none of the town buildings this year, we had had to lose a, a day of uh, service um, for, for staff. Um, it's just been an extremely busy year for, for the department. Um, the only other increase I have in my budget, um, we added uh, $20,000 for additional COVID related costs. Um, Half the fiscal year, we'll be able to use the the CARES Act funding to buy PPE and cleaning, additional cleaning. Um, but for the rest of the fiscal year, for about six months of it, we're going to have to purchase the you know the additional cleaning supplies and the the PPE equipment um, for all the departments. 
Uh, we, we really try to provide over and above what's required. Uh, we switched over all the, you know, the hand soap dispensers and paper towel dispensers and, and anything you can think of in a public building where you need to use your, use your hands to touch something to make it work. We kind of switched everything out on those. So there's going to be a um, significant increase in batteries <laughs> costs over next year so but um overall we did we, we're doing we're doing pretty well we're holding on so not a big increase the the most of the increases you know the um the um staff increases make up for the most part but no increase in any of the uh, utility costs this year In, in brief, that's, I, I haven't made my, my presentation to the selectmen yet, so. Uh. So uh, the public, uh, two, okay. You wanna talk about your two capital items? Uh, if Ben will go back to the capital sheet and close your eight, page one. Yep, my um, I have two two the ones I really to zoom in, but I believe police station roof was one that was touched on earlier, um, where we have to replace the the shingles for the um, for the station roof. Um, we we have an estimate from an architectural firm on what that might cost, so um, we we've looked into it. it it's not a, a a warranty thing we can pursue. Um, for, for whatever the reason was, we, we might, we think it might be a, a construction issue, um, something with the soffits. So it doesn't look like any of the soffits were vented properly. Um, so there was no airflow up and up and behind the insulation and the, uh, the, the, the shingles just curled. It's kind of a, a strange situation. Uh, and the other one was the, the, there's an EMC park drainage um issue it's been there for you know for years um i we we believe the original emc park design uh, when it went in um doesn't meet current standards um it's been flooding some of the downstream residents their homes this um this drainage uh the capital article will will retrofit and rebuild the existing drainage systems, but also create um, an additional overflow and an additional path for the drainage to, to discharge to where it was originally designed to um, into a kind of a wetland area um, behind the park. Uh, for whatever reason, some a phase two of the project was never completed um, and any overflow of the, of the uh, detention basins just kind of overflowed to the nearest um, nearest neighbors, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so it's a, an issue that, that's that been around for a while um, with um, in, in conjunction with Park and Rec's um, new skate park um, project, which is one of their, I'm not sure if they've, I think they've come to you folks already, I'm not sure, um, but, but there's a new skate park that's being built um, in EMC Park. And these two projects are really gonna kind of it, they're, they don't say coincide with one another, but the designs will coincide with one another as, as all the drainage, we have to account for all the drainage through the skate park. Um, but that's, uh, those are the two uh, capital articles this year. We, we really, we really- um, There's the truck. Yeah, there, there is a, tr uh, 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 there's a, uh, uh oh. Utility uh, truck with well, plow and lift gate. Yeah. I think ideally before this may not need to be um, voted at town meeting, but I would like to get, we're bringing it to capital and to appropriation. We have some existing encumbrances for part of this cost. Um, we also had some additional encumbrances that we were able to um, save on. So, um, we believe we can fund this through through existing encumbrances and our and our operating budget, so that we won't have to ask for um, anything at the annual town meeting. Um, but again, we wanted to you know bring it through the capital and appropriation process and have have a proper vote on it. Um, but the 
the, the vote might just be to support the purchase of it, um, but we're not going to need to go through um, annual town meeting. For Can the you request. talk about the truck, Dave, and, and what it is and what yep. it's for and what the plan is? Right. Currently, right now, um, it's really for to su support facilities. Facilities has um, we have used vehicles. We have the hand-me-down vehicles from from the other departments. Uh, we have a couple of police cruisers that are probably five, eight years old. Uh, we have one pickup truck, which is a, a hand-me-down from um, Mike Shepard. Actually, used to drive it around <laughs> way back when. Um, but the new the new truck will also. With the new buildings, the library and the DPW buildings, um, facilities in coordination with DPW, the snow operations, it's going to help maintain uh, clearing the parking lots because right now we don't have anywhere to, to, you know, remove the snow or throw the snow other than back into the parking lots that have been plowed early morning by DPW. And what ends up happening is, you know, half the parking spaces become unusable. Um, and it also allow us to, to more efficiently, you know, we got, we had about, I don't know, 10 buildings where we really clean, remove snow from. Uh, and, and we just use snow blowers and snow shovels right now. It'll allow us to, um, you know, back blade and clear out some of the harder areas, some of the generator doors, some of the dumpster entrances in the parking lots. Um, it'll just really allow us a lot more flexibility. Um, and it's something we don't have right now. Uh, and the other, the other pickup truck is really, it's kind of on its, it's been on its last legs um, for a long time. We, we put a lot of money into the truck and, and we don't think it's a cost efficient process anymore. I guess we're saving center school renovation for last, the, the least controversial one. Yeah, the, the center school center school renovation. Um, the ask for that one is is I know originally we had a placeholder for twenty plus something million dollars. Um, the permanent building committee is still. Um, I think last town meeting there was funding approved for a feasibility study. The permanent building committee um, are, are planning to have a presentation to the selectmen within a month or so. Um, the ask a town meeting might be simply for um, not an entire kind of design and renovation, but um, a request for proposals or a development of a request for proposals to really get some developers to be able to come in and, and give us, the town, an idea of what, what type of cooperation or coordination we could the town could do with a private developer for that site um, based on some of the preliminary options and layouts um, that the permanent building committee had been reviewing um, based off of the original recommendations from the um, from the center school reuse committee, which, which um, that was the initial study that um, they made a recommendation to the select board to, to, maintain the original section of the, the, the center school building um, for town and school services. Um, so this coming town meeting, um, there's not going to be a big ask. Um, it, it may be, you know, I, I'm not sure we, we settled on a price yet, Tim. The page says $375,000, Dave. That's, yeah, that's well, what, as of, as of last week, I know that that's for. not gonna be the ask. Um, so I, it, it's, it's, you know, we, we're, I'm working directly with, with the town manager. Um, I, and it, it, the project probably just won't be ready for, for a $375,000 ask. That was originally a design to move what the permanent building committee was gonna recommend to the select board um, to do a full schematic design. Um, of an option A, B, or C type of process. Um, but the thought it, in town here through the town manager's office and the permanent building committee um, to really do our due diligence belt and suspenders, uh, we could get a an RFP out to get some real costs from real developers on, on the value of that property 
from a developer standpoint and how much that could offset an eventual ask um, of the residents um, to do whatever the permanent building committee are, are recommending to the select board and the select board end up um, voting on for moving forward. So, so uh, Mr. Chairman, I guess you may want to hear back from Dave when it's time to make an actual recommendation on this to the, to the town. Yeah, hi. yes, I would. So we know what the cost would be and what exactly we'd be getting for that cost. And, and, I, and I apologize. It's a, this is one of those projects that's really it's changing, you know, it's changing weekly. And it's, it's sometimes it's hard, really hard to, to meet, meet some of these town meeting deadlines with a project that's, you know, continuing through a design process. And, you know, unfortunately it, the design process doesn't stop in December when we get, when we get some of these initial articles in and um, I guess see originally it went from 20 million. Then we met with um, a capital and it, and it got down to, 375 because we were going to ask for a schematic design, but as the um, feasibility study reached, you know, kind of almost its final draft form, which was only a couple of weeks ago. Um, and we reviewed it with the town manager's office and, and the permanent building committee only, only last week, um, the permanent building committee chair. Um, and it just, you know, the strategy just changed a little bit, even just last week. So, um, Even I don't know when things are going to change. <laughs> okay. All right. Any any other questions, Todd? Yeah. Does anybody have an air sickness bag? <laughs> Not drum size. <laughs> the thought, you know, I, I understand that we're not, it's not this number now, but the thought of putting $20 million into that building makes me sick. <laughs> <laughs> That's for town meeting to decide. Perfect, perfect answer. <laughs> Bill? No, I'm all set. Wayne? All set, thank you. All right. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right. I think we got everybody there who's, yes. who's going to present. So uh, next would be a review of questions from previous budget sessions. Yeah, we've I've added these three items to all the agendas. Yeah, and we really don't have a previous budget session, but we want to put these on so we we remember to talk through things that we wanted to follow up on. Well, the only other session we had was when uh, the budget was presented to the select board, and we didn't right. have a chance right. to uh, respond to that. So, and in fact, the, you know, the cover memo, I guess we could consider the cover memo of the, the January 26th uh, and any of the enclosures that were put out. If anybody has any questions that aren't department specific, we could talk about that, but. I'd like to bring that up if anyone, but I'd like to hear get input because I know uh, that was kind of the questions, you know, we had pretty much everyone showing up, but we didn't get a chance to comment with each other or. Uh, we were kind of uh, muted, <laughs> at least from each other too. So I don't know if anyone had any thoughts or maybe Tim, are there, there are some subsequent changes from that meeting too. Yes. So, so I guess we could kind of merge two and three there. Uh, there was one substantial change and it went out, it was in a uh, good news is that the governor's projected state aid has gone up substantially. So on February 2nd, just a few days after the town manager uh, released the budget memo, we produced this updated sources and uses of funds uh, to reflect that. And what that did was it didn't change any of the spending recommendations anywhere. What it did was entirely lower uh, the reserve draws, what would be projected to be drawn from stabilization reserves. And uh, so that uh, has been sent out to you twice, once today and once previously. It was a February 2nd document. And it shows that now our projection would be that we would be using $382,469 from each the general stabilization fund and the school stabilization fund to balance the spending level. Uh, and again, this, this issue with the state aid, I mean, 
we had an estimate for, that the governor had put out in his cherry sheet originally, and then the uh, estimate went up. He increased his estimate. That still hasn't been passed by the legislature. Obviously, it hasn't been enacted. It's not final, but it's a new, better data point for us to work with. The other thing I would like to share with you is that President Biden and the House and Senate are negotiating a massive COVID relief bill, and it includes $350 billion for states, cities, and towns. That's going through kind of a political firestorm right now for various reasons, mostly because some parts, some parts of the country want to use that money in ways that the president and uh, the majorities in the House and Senate don't support. And so that could be trimmed, it could be adjusted, but the bottom I'm hearing now, according to the media, is still up to 300 billion in aid for state, cities, and towns. So we know that even under the restrictive rules of the old, uh, the, the last tranche of aid, if, even if it came with those same restrictions, whatever we got would be very likely to cover at least the $200,000 we've earmarked for PPE. So right off the bat, if the aid is as restrictive as it was and we don't get as much as we think, the stabilization draws could drop by $100,000 each there. And if this aid is greater and it can displace some of the other expenses, legitimately cover some of the other expenses without having our town authorized certifying officer, Mr. Sweeney, uh, get in trouble, you know, if we can be fully compliant, those draws could come down more. So as always in this point of the budget process, we're going to learn more about the revenues. Uh, the, the more time that passes, the more certain the numbers become. Uh, the news we're hearing now seems to be good news. Uh, the news here from February 2nd is much better than the news on January 26th. And I hope we'll be back in another month with more good news. Uh, but that's that's basically where we stand right now. All right, I'm looking for some thoughts if anyone wants to comment on what they saw. Uh, Todd, we can start with you. If you have any thoughts on the budget? No, I thought I thought um, my my reaction was positive toward it all. Um, you know, and of course, when we saw the increased state aid coming in uh, the following week or whenever it was, that certainly uh, that certainly makes it even better. Um, you know, I did think that the spread, the spread of the two scenarios that were being presented seemed, uh, a little bit wide, but, um, you know, I know that it all, it all changes, you know, I, I, I don't react too much to the first pass. So, you know, Mr. Chairman, I have two more areas I can cover for you, which may provoke a couple more questions. Speaking about the two and a half percent proposal, if we did what was up there today, taking $382,000 out of the general stabilization fund, we would have a 3.9% reserve balance after doing that. We have about a 4.5% reserve balance now. The target in our financial policies is to have a 5% reserve balance. So we would drop under this plan from four and a half to 3.9, and we would still have $3.6 million. Obviously, if we have to use less, we would have a higher balance. I know preserving stabilization funds is a priority for us all. The other aspect I'd like to talk about is the use of one-time money for recurring uses. Last year, we used $1 million of one-time funds for recurring needs. You know, when we suspended the capital program last year, we still used one-time money to balance the budget and minimize the tax impact. Uh, under the scenario that's up there now, the amount of one-time funds used for recurring, recurring needs is $1.1 million under this scenario. So not great, but not much worse, not a snowballing problem a problem that gets a little bit worse in this year, balancing all these priorities of minimizing tax impact, sustaining services, 
you know, in trying to keep our financial health up. Other questions, Wayne? No, I mean, I, I, my initial going over my notes was to, to, I think Todd already mentioned it was kind of the spread, but again, for a first pass, I think it was, uh, it, it is what it is. So thank you. Bill? Well, obviously I'm new, so it's hard for me to know what happened before, but I think Tim addressed something I was a little concerned about is all of this extra money that's coming in through however, whatever sources you can't depend on it. And he addressed the fact uh, about the one-time money. So I'll learn more as we go, but that was something I, that kind of raised a red flag to me. So that, that raised a big red flag for me. And I, you know, we had a budget advisory meeting, uh, was it two weeks ago? And was it last week or two weeks ago? And I was deeply concerned. Um, I, I, just because of we're, we're, we're heading in the direction of basically the structural structural deficit and uh, or it's just structural problem with, with the budget that, you know, uh, Wayne and more so Wade and Shahadul, we've been on the committee a long time and just trying to build up the reserves of the stabilization fund took a long time. And the fact that we have to start digging into it. Um, and I know I was kind of irked a little bit with one select board member said, you know, if there's any time that we need to dig into this rainy day fund, this is the time. And I, I don't necessarily agree with that. You know, uh, you know, I know there's some definitely some residents hurting in this town. Um, but I also know there are those who are doing okay. And I don't know if the select board is going to go between a 1% increase or two and a half percent. But you know, this is a pretty healthy spending budget where we're, you know, uh, the schools are you know, everyone's over 5%, the overall budget's over five, between five and 6%. And in terms of uh, expenditures, we're not really cutting back. So the fact that we really have to dig into the stabilization fund, I just feel like we're digging ourselves a hole. And it's, and uh, I know in the uh, advisory meeting, I meeting go, if we want to, if the town wants to spend this money, then the taxpayers, you know, uh, there was a survey last year, I don't know who did it, where uh, I did ask Tim, what was the results of the survey when they asked, you know, what what services would we like in this town? What, you know, what do we, you know, are, then are we willing to pay for it? So essentially from a bird's eye view, the result was people wanted all these services, but they don't want to pay for it. And, uh, you know, and this kind of bothers me that we're, we are, you know, this is more, you know, the two and a half percent budget is basically a uh, level services plus it's, it's more than level services. So we actually moved up a lot of that's because of the growth in town or there's some human services needs right now, but we are spending more. And I just have a feeling, I just feel that if the town wants to spend it, we need to pay for it. <laughs> and uh, so I'm a little bit bothered about kind of digging into, you know, just kind of scrounging the two, you know, the 300,000 a year to go into the stabilization fund with the goal of hitting 5%, you know, where we've gotten in the last 10 years that are, you know, the cost to, to borrow you know, now we're with AAA uh, yes. rating. So, you know, that, that really helps the financial stability of the town. I just feel like if, if we're, if we can go, you know, and the question that came up is like, well, it's only $382,000. What you can say, oh, we, we're not going to do an override for $382,000. And, but I go, if we go into stabilization fund, what's it going to be next year? Is it going to be, well, we're only going to have to dig into stabilization because we don't want to have to do an override next year. Well, it's only another $500,000. I just don't want to start going down that, that that's available just because we're spending, we're still spending more and we're not willing to pay for it. And that just kind of bothers me a little bit. And I know, I think uh, one, one select board member did have reservations about going into stabilization. I would really prefer not to go into the stabilization fund I would almost take a preference. I would say, go with the budget we have, and if we get that extra funding coming in, and we find the revenue sources, then we can in, then we can increase the services back rather than, okay, if we, we take from the stabilization fund, and if we don't need it, we don't we don't take it all. You know, Mr. Chair, those are those are all good points. Um, you know, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, and and while you're talking, as I as I, you know, look back at that meeting more, you know, I mean, I do, I do sympathize with, um, you know, townsfolks who are having a difficult time, whether it's because of the pandemic or 
you know, or not. Um, but at the same time, you know, as, as we roll into this meeting and I see, you know, maybe not the latest, but at least at one point, uh, you know, looking at a number and ask for something like center school, even the current ask for center school, you know, $375,000 to do a study on possibly spending, you know, 15, 20 million dollars or more. Um, you know, it's sending conflicting messages. And I don't know if you noticed that was a debt exclusion. So that's outside of the. Yep. No, I and have, no. And, real, I and really, the, the reason we have to go into stabilization is because otherwise we would need an override. And I don't think yeah. any select board member well, wants to ask for an override for $382,000. Or, or, or you have to make more cuts. <laughs> right. So anyway, I just want to, I, that was my concern when I know we didn't get a chance to uh, respond when, when it was presented to the select board. Maybe that was the reason uh, uh, Brendan Tedstone didn't want any uh, commentary from the school committee or appropriations, but. That was definitely my concern when I first heard that. And you know, and Norman Cavallo, he brought out this this is the deficit we're kind of digging. And so if you're thinking about what's next year or the year, at some point we we're, it's gonna be an override and it's gonna have to be a big one. Uh, and th that that just concerns me that um, we're kind of I used it, I use it for OPEB, but we're kicking the can down the road a little bit. And um, so anyway, I just wanted to voice my concerns about that. And I'm sure as, as this is early, this is the first pass. And then I'm sure there's going to be a lot happening in the next uh, two months. Okay, well, this has been a great, I think this has been a great session. And uh, Bill, I'd like to tell you, it's always this smooth. Everything's always this good. So <laughs> I don't know if we're just getting it right or or what, but it looks like next week we have library, health services, youth and family services, and the senior center should be a fairly quick meeting. And uh, if there's any more revenue updates and these other factors, we'll get back to you. I did not take any questions to be answered next week. So if anybody has any questions, uh, that, you know, speak now or it can kick another week further up. And the report, is a massive production and it comes together with all these pieces of text and graphics and decisions and tables and documents and dead information. And we are beginning the process of assembling that. Uh, we start with last year's document as a bare bones and we fly through and update the whole thing and add some new sections and, and uh, see what's new relevant information we have to add. And we are still steaming toward uh, approving that report on April 8th. So that is our objective. Hopefully a vote on the Appropriation Committee report on April 8th. Boy, that seems so early. Wasn't it like 14 days before? We had well, to the, the, the deadline, I mean, if you, if you want to wait until we're at the actual legal limit, it would be that it must be done by April 19th. So uh, that's the that would be your statutory requirement. If you if we if we, if we must wait to the last moment. <laughs> well, I know I know Tim, you and Ben and everyone do an awesome job putting you did an awesome job with the report last year. So I bet you you're and uh, you already have every, a lot in place anyway. So uh, what will be challenging, uh, Mr. Chairman, is if people want to make changes on April 18th, <laughs> the 70 page document that's all interwoven with you know, uh, balancing tables and, and uh, to make a round of consistent changes on the day before it's due or two days before it would do would be very problematic. So uh, see how the process goes. All right, thank you. Uh, is there anything else anyone wants to bring up? I, that's all the uh, items on the agenda tonight. Mr. Chair, I move to adjourn. Second. All right, meeting adjourned. Thank you very much. Very good meeting. And thank you everyone for your presentations. Thanks. Good night.